Hi, good morning. Thank you so much to Ben for leading us through those hymns of praise to God. And it's my privilege now to share with you a message from God's Word on this important topic, True or False, Faith Alone Saves. As we think about this, this a question, true or false, faith alone saves, I want to, to start by focusing on this word, saves. I want us to think at this time about salvation. I believe that salvation is something that everybody desires. I mean, all of us, we, we want salvation. And of course, all of us desire to be in heaven. I'm sure nobody wants to go to hell. Everybody wants to go to heaven, to, to a better place after this life is over. But here's the thing, right? it's such an important topic, salvation. How can we be saved? People are confused and people will give you different answers to this question. You go on the street, you ask 10 different people this question, what must I do to go to heaven? And you'll receive 10 different answers. This morning, I hope that we need no longer be confused, but we want to look at the Bible to see what must we do to be safe. As we look in the Bible, the Bible first tells us the problem, and that is the problem of sin. Sin is the transgression of God's law, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. In other words, we sin when we disobey God. For example, if God tells us that we should not tell lies, and we do that, we lie, we sin, we disobey God. When we have jealousy in our hearts, when we hate our brothers and sisters, when we do evil against others, that's when we sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 to 10 gives us just a few examples about what exactly sin is. If I were to read that through the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 to 10, here it's written. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so here's a summary of what sin is. Sin happens when we have fornications. That is referring to sexual relationships outside of marriage. Sin happens when we, when we commit idolatry, when we worship gods other than the one true God. Sin happens when we are involved in homosexuality. Sin happens when we steal, when we covet, when we get drunk with alcohol, and when we revile and ex extort others. So these are some examples of sin. And we see here, the problem is this, that when we have sin, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. And certainly sin is something we all struggle with. I don't think, I don't think any of us can say that, oh, I've never sinned before. I'm a goody two-shoes. I've, I've always done what is perfect. All of us, we struggle with this. As the Bible also said in Romans 3 verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I believe that this is something we struggle with. Perhaps in times past, we have done some bad things. Maybe we have hurt others. And perhaps there's certain things that we did that we regretted or we feel guilty about. And most importantly, realize that when we sin, sin leads to terrible consequences. Most importantly, perhaps, sin separates us from God. As written in Isaiah chapter 59, verse, verse 1 and 2, For the Lord's hand is not shortened that it will not save, neither his ear heavy that he will not hear, but your sins and your iniquities has separated between you and your God so that he will not hear you. So sin separates us from God. With God, there is everlasting life. With God, you know, God is in heaven. We want to be with God in heaven, but sin prevents us. And when we are separated from God, the, the next consequence is this, that it leads us to death. Death is the consequence of sin. And most importantly, this is talking about spiritual death. As Romans chapter 6, verse 23 tells us, for the wages of sin is death. That is the corresponding penalty. And as I say, we're not just talking about physical death here, we're talking about spiritual death. Hell is described as the place where the second death happens. 
And I'd like to just read a text in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. And here it is written, But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Indeed, it's not enough to die one time here on this earth. When we go to that terrible place in hell, you die a second time because there we suffer for all eternity. Sin certainly is a problem, but we are so thankful. The Bible tells us that there's a solution for this sin that we've done in, in our lives. And God has given us His Son, Jesus, to save us from our sins. As we go, Jesus, we truly appreciate what Jesus has done for us. After all, Jesus does not owe us salvation. In fact, Jesus, as God, He, he, he enjoyed His glory together with the Father in heaven. But we can read in Philippians 2, verse 6 to 7, that He left His glory to become a human being just like any of us. In Philippians 2, verse 6 to 7, here the Bible tells us about Jesus that being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. So 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to this earth to be a human being just like us. And he had a mission. God gave him a mission to suffer and to die for our sins. And that's why I read in the following verse, verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Why did Jesus have to do this? Why did Jesus have to come to earth to suffer and to die? And this is the reason. Because Jesus provides the perfect substitute for our sins. That through his death, the death of a perfect lamb of God, that he can, he can wash away the sins of this whole earth. And although we were sinners, that we did evil things, but God, through His love, was able to help us receive the atonement. And because of Jesus, therefore, we can escape the penalty of sin. What a tremendous love they received from God. Indeed, as written in John 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have perished everlasting life. And so this is what we're talking about here to focus on this part of the verse, everlasting life. This is what salvation is about. We want to go to heaven. We want to live forever and not to go to the other side, to go to hell. And so that's what we've been talking about for this morning, the important topic. We want to find out what must we do to be safe. And we've seen that through Jesus we can receive salvation. But now I'd like to talk about the faith. Faith. What is the relationship between faith and salvation? Looking back at John chapter 3 and verse 16, we see that we have the potential to receive everlasting life. In fact, Jesus gives every single one of us the potential to achieve this. To receive salvation and everlasting life, but there is a condition. And here's the condition is that we must believe in Jesus. We must have faith in Jesus in order to receive it. It's not really a difficult condition, actually. In fact, it's only logical. It's only logical that to receive the reward from God, we must come to God. We must accept Him and we must have faith in Him. Again, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, here is written, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and then not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Well, this verse reminds us really that salvation is something that none of us deserve. After all, we have done evil things in the past, we hurt others, and we hurt God. But because of God's love, because of His grace, He gave us salvation. It's a gift. It's a gift, and, and we're so thankful that, that God has extended this to us. 
But once again, this verse reminds us there's a condition in order to receive this gift. This gift can be achieved through faith. This gift can be achieved through faith. To believe in Jesus, to, to trust in Him. And that's how we can receive that great salvation. So brethren and friends, a simple question for us to consider this morning. Do we have faith in Jesus? Do we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He was sent to die for our sins? And brethren and friends, I submit to you that we must believe in Jesus. In fact, there's plenty of reasons for us to believe in Jesus. After all, when Jesus came to earth 2,000 years ago, He did many wonderful and amazing things. And these miracles that Jesus performed is the absolute proof that He is the Son of God. In John chapter 20, verse 30 to 31. And here it is written, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. Many miracles and signs did Jesus, and there's too many that I do not have the time this morning to go through every single one of them with you. If you have any interest to learn more about what Jesus did, I'll be happy to arrange a time with you, to sit down with you, to talk about it. But of course, today, right, today on this side of the cross, we do not see it for ourselves, but thankfully the Bible records it for us, all these wonderful things he did. For example, we can talk about how Jesus walked on water. We talk about how Jesus healed the sick instantaneously. Those who were on the wheelchair since they were born, they will stand up and walk and jump. We can talk about how in John chapter 6, for example, Jesus would feed 5,000 people with just five loaves of bread and two fishes. So all these things, no ordinary man can do these things. Uh, these are supernatural, and these prove that Jesus is the Son of God. And so this tells us a bit about what faith is about. As he, written in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Quoting from the ESV version. Although we cannot see God, although... We cannot see Jesus. After all, Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. We do not see Him. And yet we have faith. And yet we are assured that Jesus is real, that Jesus is God. And brethren and friends, I want to make it clear that this is not some blind faith. This is not a leap in the dark. But as I said, there's plenty of testimony and evidence to prove to us that this truly is real. And so, that is faith. That in order to receive this salvation from God, we need to have faith in Jesus Christ. But now we come really to the crucial part of today's lesson. Faith alone. There are those who believe that faith alone saves. And this is something we want to address for today. True or false? What is this idea of faith alone? Faith alone is the idea that we are saved the moment we believe and accept Jesus into our hearts. And different people have different ways of expressing it. Some may say that if you want to be saved, all you have to do is to say the sinner's prayer in your heart to Jesus, and at that moment, you are saved. And since it is faith alone, therefore, these people will contend that nothing else we do can save us. So this is a doctrine that is believed by a number of people today. This is something you may have heard of. Maybe you've been taught this right, by, by certain teachers. Right? Faith alone, that the moment you believe in Jesus with your heart, you don't need to do anything else because at the moment you are already saved. As we think about this idea of faith alone, there are two extremes where we can go to. On the left extreme, of course, you have saved by faith alone. And on the right extreme, you have saved by works alone. Today, we want to, of course, discover the truth. Today, we want to discover what does the Bible say. Before we talk about faith alone, maybe it's good for us to go to the other side 
and talk about works alone. Does the Bible teach that we are saved by works only? And as we look at the Bible, we understand that no, the Bible says we are not saved by works only. For example, in Romans chapter 4, verse 2 to 3 here, the writer tells us that we are not saved by works of the law of Moses. And it's written, verse 2, For if Abraham were justified by works, he had whereof to glory, but not before God. For what said the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So it says here, Abraham was not justified by works. And if you look at the entire context from chapter 3 to chapter 4, you realize that, that the writer here is making a contrast between the works of Moses versus faith in Jesus. If you look in the same chapter, chapter 4, and you go down to verse 10, the writer would, would contend that circumcision does not save us. And what are some examples of the works of the law of Moses? Things like animal sacrifices, circumcision, and dietary restrictions. In times past, under the law of Moses, the Jews were not allowed to eat unclean foods like pork and crab. Right? These, these were certain foods they're not allowed to eat. But these things, as the writer here says, is under the law of Moses. These things cannot save us anymore. Today, it doesn't matter whether you are circumcised or not. Today, it doesn't matter whether you eat pork or chicken, right? Because these things no longer save us, but rather we are saved by faith in Jesus. What else? In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9, the Bible further contends. God tells us that we are not saved by works of merit. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9, it is written here. <clears throat> For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are reminded here that we are not saved by works. No one can tell God that, oh, I've helped 1,000 poor people in my lifetime. I deserve to go to heaven. Oh, I've, I've, uh, I've helped 10 people today so that erases the, the one bad thing that I did. Right? Our good works cannot erase the sin that we did. And we are reminded that the only way that we even have a chance of being saved is because of Jesus. That, that God, through His grace and love, that He has given us Jesus. Otherwise, by ourselves, by our own merit, we could never have been saved. And so as we think about this spectrum, we can immediately cross out the right extreme that certainly we are not saved by works, right? We are saved only because of Jesus. But let's now go to the other side. Saved by faith only. Right? I, what does the Bible say about this? Does the Bible teach that we are saved by faith only? And I believe this one verse perhaps resolves this argument once and for all. James chapter 2, verse 24 tells us, Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. If you do a word search in your Bibles, you type the word faith alone or faith only. This is the only verse in the Bible where faith only appears. And this only, and in this one verse in the Bible, what they say, we are not saved by faith only. So I hope that this answers today's question. But I think it's premature, perhaps, to, to just leave, leave it as it is. Uh, let's look at the entire context of James chapter 2. What is James chapter 2 talking about? I'd like to start by reading James chapter 2, verse 14 to verse 17. And here it's written, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he have faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warm and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. The writer here in this entire context from James 2 verse 14 onwards is trying to tell us that there's no such thing as faith alone. 
In verse 14, it says, if a man says he has faith and he has not works, what's the point? Is that a true faith? Is that a saving faith? Can such a faith save him to say that you have faith but no works? And how about if a man says he has faith but he fails to help others? Does he have faith? Can a man say that I'm a Christian, I have faith in God, but you don't help the poor, you don't love one another, all right? you do bad things? Is that really faith? And so, what does the writer say verse 17? Faith without works is dead. Right? Faith without works is not really faith at all. It's a dead faith. It's a fake faith, you may say. Continue reading from verse 18 to verse 20 now. Yeah, a man may say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. But will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Is it possible to show your faith without works? Is it possible? How do you know you have faith? Show me. No works. Nothing to show. Instead, the person says, is it not better if I show you my faith by my works? Therefore, my works will prove that I truly have a faith. And the writer continues to contend that if we have faith without works, we are no different from demons and evil spirits. After all, when we read the gospel accounts, we see about how the evil spirits, when they, when they saw Jesus, they acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God. They believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I mean, that's great, isn't it? Isn't it great to believe that Jesus is the Son of God? But are these demons saved? No. Why? Because they believe in Jesus, but they do not do what Jesus said. There's no works. And so, therefore, faith without works is dead. The last part of this passage, verse 21 and verse 24. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. So, once again, we see again the example of Abraham. In, in Romans chapter 4, interestingly, we read earlier, it says there that Abraham was not justified by works. But as we saw based on the context, Abraham was not justified by works of the law of Moses. But now in this passage in James chapter 2, we see Abraham was justified by works. What kind of works? Works of faith. And the works that he did made his faith perfect. And we know that Abraham was faithful because of what he did. It is evidence of his faith. For example, we see how he offered Isaac upon the altar. When God told Abraham, to offer his only begotten son on the altar, Abraham did it. Or oh, he was willing to do it. And thankfully, God stopped him from doing that. But his works made his faith perfect. And therefore, the conclusion is this, verse 24. A man is justified by works and not by faith only. So as we think about this spectrum once again, I think we can safely say from our reading of James chapter 2, that there is no such thing as being saved by faith only. And the Bible tells us that the truth, perhaps, is somewhere in the middle. What is real faith? Real faith is somewhere in the middle. It is to have faith that is coupled together with works. And so, let's re-examine again what is real faith. Of course, we know that faith is to believe in Jesus as we see in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We do not see Jesus for ourselves, not yet, but we believe in Him. And we do not just believe in Him, but we trust in Him. Just as Abraham trusted God that wherever God told him to go to a strange place, 
Abraham followed God. Abraham trusted that that God would protect him. Abraham trusted that God would lead him in the right direction. In the same way, we trust Jesus that if we if we invest our life in Jesus, it will lead to some reward that it will be profitable. And perhaps more importantly, that faith means to obey Jesus, to do whatever Jesus tells us to. Not not just to believe in our hearts, but to make sure it translates into action. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11 is a great chapter to read if you want to gain some encouragement about faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4 to 9, for example, we see different examples of men of faith. Men like Abel, men like Enoch, and Noah, and Abraham. How they have faith. And how do we know they have faith? For example, in verse 4, it says, By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. Verse 5, By faith, Enoch pleased God. In verse 7, by faith, Noah built an ark. And verse 8, by faith, Abraham went to a strange place. He followed God. So how do we know they have faith? They did something. They obeyed God. And that's how we know they have faith. And that's what real faith is about. So as we consider this question once again, true or false, faith alone saves. I think we can safely say, from the Bible, that it is false, that faith alone does not save. In fact, faith alone is dead. So therefore, if faith alone does not save us, we need to go back to the original question, which is this, what must I do so that I can be saved, so that I can go to heaven to be with God? And as we gather all the evidence from the Bible, we have this answer. Firstly, that we must hear the gospel. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The Bible tells us that to be saved, the gospel, the good news, we need to open the Bible because these are the words that can teach us what we must do to be saved. And then secondly, of course, we must believe in Jesus as we already read, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We must believe in Jesus in order to receive salvation. And thirdly, in addition, we must repent of our sins. It's written in Luke chapter 13, verse 3. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. We have seen how terrible sin, sin is. Sin has consequences. Sin brings death. Sin leads us to hell. And therefore, we must get rid of sin from our lives. We must repent of it. Fourthly, we must confess Jesus. As written in Romans chapter 10, verse 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So when we confess Jesus with our mouth, the Bible tells us He leads us to salvation also. Fifthly, we must be baptized. The Bible talks about how in order to become a Christian, in order to be saved, we must be baptized in water, to be submerged in water. And as we are submerged in water, Acts chapter 22 verse 16 tells us that our sins are washed away. Right, through that waters of baptism, God removes our sin, washes us clean. And of course, after we are baptized, that's when we live a new life. We are a new creature. And as a new creature, we must continue to live faithfully in obedience to God. As written in Revelation 2 verse 10, that when we are faithful unto death, that's when God will give us the crown of life. So as you can see here, the Bible is clear what we must do to be saved. It's not just faith alone, but there are at least five steps of salvation. To hear the gospel, to believe in Jesus, to repent of our sins, to confess Jesus, and to be baptized. And after which, we live in continual obedience to God. I hope you found this message this morning to be enlightening and that it has perhaps 
help you not to be confused, but we can be enlightened. We can know the truth because we have the Bible and the Bible gives us the answers to all these important questions. If today you realize that you have not done what is necessary to be safe, you have been confused before, we would like to help you. If you want to be baptized, do get in touch with us and we'll love to help you to be baptized. If you'd like to know more, to clarify someone's doubts, get in touch with us and we'll be happy to sit down with you for a Bible study. You may, you may get in touch with us through our website, through our email, or even through this Facebook page. But whatever request you have need of us, do let us know and we'll do what we can to help you. In a moment's time, uh, Brother Benjamin will be leading us in a closing hymn. And as we think about the lyrics of the hymn, are we washed in the blood? Have you today been washed? Have you been washed through the waters of baptism so that the blood of Christ can wash you from your sins? I thank you for your time. And I now, we now have that closing hymn. We thank Ernest for speaking to us this morning, and I hope that all of us have been uh, encouraged, and I hope that all of us are convinced that faith alone uh, does not save. And we appreciate him uh, for speaking to us this morning. Our final hymn for this morning, Are You Washed in the Blood? We'll sing all four stanzas of this hymn, Are You Washed in the Blood? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the self-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments for the sunny white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Saviour's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom come up, will your robes be white, pure and white in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion's bright and be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb?